Good morning. Good morning again. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, what a good morning it is. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, as you have heard, my name is Kinua. Sounds like Kinua, the, the seed uh, that uh, people, the healthy seed that people have for, for a meal. Yeah, so you can have me for lunch after this someone. Uh, but it's really good that you are here today and we can get to listen to God's word together. Uh, and I hope that we get to really connect well with one another as we connect with God. Uh, well, let me start with a story of um, the former U.S. president of the United States of America uh, called uh, George Bush. He was uh, in an airport. Uh, sorry, may I switch this off? Probably. Good. Take two. A story is told of the former U.S. President George Bush in an airport one day, and uh, he met this elderly man with a long beard and long robes, and he was holding a staff. And George Bush was very curious at this elderly man, and he wanted to get to know him a little bit. And so uh, he went and went asked him, I'd like to know you a little bit more. But this elderly man shunned him, actually walked away, did not even want to look at him. So George Bush was like, do you know who I am? And the elderly man said, yes, I do. So why don't you want to talk to me? The elderly man said, well, my name is Moses, and the last time the, a Moses talked to a bush, he was deserted in the desert for 40 years. Well, it's not a true, true story. <laughs> but today we get to talk about Moses. Oh, Moses is one of the great characters in the Bible. And we have been looking at some great characters in God's word uh, from uh, Hebrews chapter 11. So if you're joining us today, welcome into this conversation that we've been having about stories of faith, how God uses ordinary men and women in extraordinary ways. And so today we get to Moses. But right at the beginning of this uh, chapter, we saw the definition of faith. But it not only defines what faith is, Faith is, it also gives us examples of men and women who lived by faith. And I defined faith this way, that faith is confidence in God's word or what he says that results in our obedience regardless of circumstances or consequences. Faith is trust and obedience in God's word or God's voice that results in our obedience regardless of circumstances and consequences. Uh, one of the uh, famous preachers, Dr. Stanley, Charles Stanley, now has gone to be in the Lord, he used to say, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Uh, another of his famous quotes is this, the bottom line in the Christian life is obedience. And most people don't even like that word. You have to have courage to be obedient to God. One more quote by Charles Stanley. God is responsible for the consequences of our obedience. We are responsible for the consequences of our disobedience. But today's sermons are not based on Charles Stanley's uh, quotes. It's really on the story of Moses. So let's catch on the story in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 to 28. So if you have a hard copy of the text, you can turn with me to Hebrews 11, but it's also going to be on screen. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child. Uh, some versions will say that he was a divine child. And they were not afraid of the kings called Pharaoh decrees or his edit. 
It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the opp oppression of God's people instead of, the, of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborns. Now, this first, these five verses are a summary of about 12 chapters in the book of Exodus. This is a summary of what happens in the book of Exodus chapter 1 all the way to chapter, chapter 12. Thankfully, I'll not read it for you today. But if you're interested in the whole story, the full picture, please, uh, this week, take some time and read those 12 uh, chapters. Actually, if you're interested in the story of Moses, you can read it in, through the book of uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How's that for uh, your assignment for the week? <laughs> but in these few verses, we see two things. The faith of uh, Moses' parents and Moses' faith. Verse 23, it was by faith that Moses' par Moses's parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's pharaoh's decree. Now, that phrase, not afraid, is repeated over and over again. Now, if you're here last week, I used the illustration of an exam, a test, a quiz throughout my sermon. You remember that? Uh, well, friends, today I do have a quiz for you. So it is now quiz time. So, who can tell me, um, I got chocolate. Who can tell me the name of Moses' parents? Let's start with the name of the dad. Oh, okay, let's start with the mom. That's an easier one. If you're here on Mother's Day, the name was uh, said a few times, if you remember. It's actually an open book text, uh, test, test. So you can, you can <laughs> open your Bibles, you can Google. Going once, going twice. I got chocolate. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, man. Someone. No, it doesn't start with Z. Okay, I'll give you a clue. Uh, the mom's name starts with J, and it is not Josephine or Joseph. <laughs> Come on. Joke. So who said what? Jokabed. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I, you remember last week I said follow the instructions. You could have Googled and there, you got a chocolate. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, missed. Oh, oh. oh go, go. <laughs> And so Jokabed and the dad that was called Amram. Okay, so here's an easy one. Here's an easy one. Here's an easy one. Who knows uh, his, the name of the brother and the sister? The sister was Miriam. Miriam. Yes, Miriam and the brother? Aaron. 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 Now, what shall we do? I only have one chocolate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, you guys can't decide. Can I have it? <laughs> okay, there you go. Oh, uh, well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so watch out for another quiz. There might be another chocolate. But here's a key word, not afraid. Moses' parents were not afraid. These two words sum up how Moses grew up. This is what the parents were all about. You see, what was happening was that uh, when you open the pages of Exodus chapter 1, is that the king, King Pharaoh, 
had made a decree that all the, all the Hebrew sons should be killed. He actually ordered uh, a genocide for all the Hebrew boys, an infanticide. And what Moses' parents, uh, parents did was that they hid Moses for three months. In the midst of this evil edict, they chose to hide their child, which meant that they were also putting their own lives, not just the life of the son, in danger. It's very possible that they could have lost their son and also lost their lives. And Pharaoh was very serious about it. And so you see that out of not fearing what uh, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's edict, and in other chapters, uh, in other books of the Bible, they tell us that in, because they feared the Lord, then they chose to hide Moses for three months. And you know the how the story goes. They put uh, the baby in a basket, then put him onto the river and sent Miriam to go and watch over the basket as the baby went. And fortunately, Pharaoh's daughter was having a bath. And she was there with the maids and the servants and they saw this basket with the baby and took the baby. And of course, Miriam showed up and said, hey, you know what? Uh, I know of someone who can take care of this baby. You see, what was happening in that culture, if you are of the noble class, you never took, raised your child or nursed the child. You had maids and servants do that for you. And so here is Miriam going and saying, I know of someone who's very good at this job, and they would be more than willing at a, <laughs> to take care of this baby. And so Jochebed gets to raise Moses, be with Moses, and does that not at her expense, but at the expense of Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses is not only raised by the mother, but also Moses is raised in Pharaoh's palace. He got world-class education. He enjoyed the privileges and the pleasures of being in Pharaoh's palace. But what, what is very interesting is the decision that the parents made to trust the Lord against all odds, against what's happening in the culture, against the Pharaoh's edict, and to let the child go. So the question for us it is, is this. As a parent, have you trusted God enough to take care of your children? I mean, this, this must have been very hard for Moses' parents. And this question is really a hard one because our society tells us to keep the children away from God. Some even claim that Christianity is dangerous. We should keep, that's, that's what our society is saying. And anyway, we naturally find it hard to trust others to take care of our own children. We believe that we know what's best for our kids. But in the grand scheme of things, children actually do not belong to us. Psalm 127 verse 3 says that children are a heritage from God. They are a reward from him. So what would it take for you to trust God enough to take care of your children? You're thinking this is just for those of un, um, among us who have littlies, who have small kids. But even for you who are older, uh, your kids will always be your children. Whether they are 17 or 70, uh, they are still your kids. What would it take for you to trust God enough to take care of your children? Hear what Jesus says about children in Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Um, the disciples were trying to see who's, who's going to have a good spot in heaven. 
And then hear what Jesus says. You know, you'd expect Jesus would say, oh, well, Simon, it's going to be you. Or uh, maybe it's going to be the one who's a preacher today morning. Or it's a missionary. Or it's the one who gives the most to the church in terms of their time and their money. Uh, he doesn't say anything like that. Look at the illustration that Jesus gives. Verse 2, it says, he called a little child to him and placed a child among, among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, unless you have the humility and the openness and the innocence like that of a child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly or the humble position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Not just having the humility of a child, but also welcoming children. Then listen to what he says in verse 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drawn, drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus is really pre pretty serious about it, right? We are to have the kind of humility and innocence and belief like that of a child, but we are also to welcome children. See, friends, God has a plan for every person, every boy, girl, and child. And your important task as a parent, as a grandparent, as an uncle, as a church family, is to pray for our children and to prepare them to do the work God has planned for them to do. We are to raise our children not just as good citizens. We are not just to give them a good education. But we are to raise them in a way that they will love and trust the Lord. What a responsibility. What a privilege. Faith always allows us to entrust even our own children to God. May that be true of each one of us. Having looked at the faith of the parents, we now look at Moses' faith. Verse 24 and 25, it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. How did Moses come to this conclusion? Here is Moses, having been raised, he has been given a world-class education. Remember that e Egypt was then a superpower. If you wanted the best economy, the best education, you went to Egypt. And here he's been brought up in Egypt, not just in Egypt, but as a member of Pharaoh's family. World-class education. He has all the comfort that this world has to offer. He has probably power because he might become a king as a grandson to Pharaoh. He has possession or has access to possession, pleasure, and prestige. Yet despite all that, he made a choice to no longer be associated with the Egyptians. What is happening? Moses, are you out of your mind? We are all working hard to have this kind of thing. How was he able to do that? I believe it was because he was raised by the parents and who had an influence in him. Chances are her mother, while nursing and raising him, used her proximity to shape his future worldview. Her influence made an impact, as we see by uh, Moses' decision as an adult. But don't take my word for it. Acts chapter 7, 23 to 25 says, When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would re realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. 
The second reason why Moses made this decision is because he identified with the Hebrews. He, don't, he did not identify with the Egyptians. How did he know that he's an Israelite and he is not an Egyptian? The Hebrews, um, at, at this stage, at this time in the, in the Old Testament, the Israelites are called Hebrews. The Hebrews used to circumcise their boys at eight days, okay? So it was very clear for him that he's not an Egyptian. The Egyptians never circumcised their boys. So he knows, he sees, he has physical evidence that he is a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. And then he's being raised by the mom and the family that are Hebrews. And so at some point, uh, at around the age 40, isn't it interesting, that's around when most men mature. <laughs> Because, uh, well, yeah, you're a mature boy. <laughs> but what is happening? He makes this drastic decision at age 40. He kind of has come to the realization of who he really is. His identity. We, we live in a society that is grappling with identity issues. We are being told that you can be all that you are and everything that is good is within you and inside you. Be all that you can be. But we can see the identity confusion in our world. Well, Moses has gotten to a place where he has had to come face to face with his identity issues. And he's grappling with them. Am I Hebrew or am I Egyptian? And he sees his own people that are being oppressed in slavery. And he has this deep sense he wants to save his people. He wants to redeem them. He actually has... And yes, the Lord has called him to save and redeem his people. But he goes around the wrong way. What did he do? He went. Uh, Moses' stand was somewhat clumsy, to say the least. He hadn't necessarily thought it through. But one thing is crystal clear. He took vengeance for his people by killing an Egyptian who mistreated a Hebrew worker. He crossed the red line. There was no explaining or turning back from an action like that. He made a choice willing to live or die with the consequences. And take, let me take a moment to use Moses an, as an example. I want, you, I want to give you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Friends, once you make a clear choice to stand with God, you will experience ill treatment. You will suffer consequences. You will face fallout. So if you want to live your life as though you are in a popularity context, contest, the choice to follow God and his kingdom is not your best option. Obedience to God does not result in popularity with the world and the contemporary culture, even popularity among Christians. The Apostle Paul says it in a very straightforward way when he's talking to his spiritual son, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, 15, uh, verse 12. He says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let that verse sink in. It doesn't say some people who choose to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Neither does it say that those who choose to live godly in Christ Jesus will face trouble here and there. Rather, it says everyone who chooses to live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. At the very least, negative repercussions will come your way if you stand for Jesus Christ. You may no longer be in the in crowd. You may face opposition, bullying, or even public humiliation. Would you like to follow Christ now? For some of us who have been following Christ, May this be a reality check for us. But it doesn't stop there. 
That's why in Hebrews 11.26 begins with an important phrase, considering the reproach of Christ. To consider something is to think something deeply, carefully. The whole verse reads this, the reproach of Christ greater riches, considering the reproach of Christ, of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to their reward. Just before that verse, we have, Moses has taken a decision to, not to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Sin is fun. Sin can be enjoyable. Anyone who tells you differently either hasn't sinned or is lying to you. Because if sin were as, uh, as terrible as it is, then why do we really enjoy it? The Bible does not hide this truth. But the second thing we consider in this passage is that while sin is, is, is fun, while it is fun, it is a passing pleasure at best. Moses considered everything that he had, even the things that were ungodly, as passing pleasures. They come, they go. But he does, when he thinks of that against the reproach of Christ, when he thinks of that against the reward that is kept for him, as he thinks of what he's leaving behind, against the promises of God, he chooses the promises of God. He chooses God. Moses knew the eternal reward that awaited him in the hands of the one true God would be much more meaningful than anything he might experience on this earth. No matter how fun it might be in the moment, he understood what truly mattered which is why he made the choice he did. He picked a side. You need to pick a side. The reward of God is greater than the treasures of man. But unless you believe that, you won't make the wise decision like Moses did. You will wind up hanging out with the world rather than giving yourself fully to God. Moses made up his mind as a result of his faith, of his trust and obedience in God, in both a, re a reward to experience in his lifetime and an eternal one. Verse 27 explains it. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Again that phrase, not afraid, not fearing the king, not fearing man. For he endured he could have enjoyed, but when he considered what is ahead of him, he was willing to endure as seeing him who is unseen. Moses exercised faith in choosing God's presence over the earthly king. Yet as I mentioned earlier, he didn't necessarily think through it at first. At first he was just a hot-headed guy. Thought, well, I'm all this and a bag of chips, I'm going to save my people, but it took so many years in the desert for him to be fashioned in how God wanted him to save his people. He made some wrong actions. I do want to remind you that based on Moses' life, even though you may be in a shaky faith right now. Or timid. In times of confusion and doubt. God can raise you up and strengthen you to complete great works for him. God had a plan for Moses. He chose to trust the Lord. He did make some mistakes, major mistakes. But the Lord, but he still chose to follow God, and God still used him. Hey, probably as a follower of Christ, you are thinking to yourself, can God really use me? I have made some poor choices in life, some really poor choices. 
Hopefully you haven't murdered like Moses. And you're probably wondering, would God still use me? Would God be gracious to me? Maybe you still have this burning desire that the Lord would use you in a way that is honoring to him. And you're thinking, I'm used up. I don't have anything. I don't have, I've done many, many mistakes. I don't have any energy. I, I don't have any skill strategy. I'm done. You're probably in your wilderness, like Moses eventually went to the wilderness. You've probably had your 40 years of wilderness. But God can still miraculously show up like he did to Moses in a burning bush and says, you are standing on holy ground. I am the Lord and I'm going to use you. Hey, remember, Moses was a stammerer. He was not the best of communicators. Eventually, he had to have a spokesperson, his brother Aaron. But God still used him. God used Moses with his staff. You remember this later on in the story of Moses when he went before Pharaoh. When he now had spent time in the desert and comes back to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. He uses a staff. That staff was, a, was all that he was. It, was. it was his identity. He was a shepherd. It was his form of income as a shepherd. And God says, what's that you have in your hand? I can use it. What's that you have in your hand? Is it a gory, ugly past? Yes, the Lord can use that for his glory and for your good. Would you surrender it to him? Or probably you're here and you do not follow Christ as Lord and Savior. I would love you to have this personal relationship with Christ. So that God can use you in a way that you have never imagined. In a way that is going to bring so much joy and hope in your life. And yes, there is a reward for you. It's not all lost. I want you to experience God. And you can make that decision today. Don't fear man. Don't fear society and what everyone has to say. But make a decision today to follow Christ. Would you make this decision? You may identify with Moses in his impulsivity during his younger years. Or maybe with him in his insecurity in his older years. Whatever the case, Moses gives all of us an example of what it means to be redeemed from the frailties of our flesh and be used by the power of God working in us. His story ought to inspire and encourage all of us to dream big as to what God can and will do through each one of us. Let us pray. Lord, there are many of us who, like Amran and Jochebed, have been put in an awkward situation and we don't know how to protect our kids, how to raise our kids. We, Lord, give us wisdom and discernment. Give us faith and trust. Uh, may we have faith enough to, to hold our kids lightly so that they may be used by you. Lord, as parents, we want the best for our kids. But Lord, may we never forget that the best really comes from you. And so help every parent here to raise our kids in the ways of the Lord. Help every parent here to pray for the kids. Lord, I pray that every child here, every kid here in this church, Lord, will grow to love and trust you. And Lord, we also pray that we will not be afraid, as was demonstrated in the life of Moses, that he made a choice, despite the privilege and the position and the power and the pleasures 
that were there in Pharaoh's palace, he was willing to let go all of that because he identified with you. I pray, O oh Lord, for those of among us who are followers of Christ, who will never forget that we are your sons and daughters, to always identify with you and not to hide it, to speak about you, to show your love, to express your care and concern to, every, to all humanity. Give us the compassion of Christ. Give us the boldness to speak of Christ. Lord, I also want to pray for those who are under the sound of my voice and do not know you as your Lord and Savior. They have never surrendered their lives to you, Lord. I pray that by your Spirit you will convict them, that they will make a step closer to you this day. May they come to see and enjoy the hope and the joy that we have in you. May they say yes to you. Lord, I pray for us as a church family. I pray that we'll be a people who are not afraid of man, but have faith in you. Not afraid of the consequences of humanity, but more so of the reproach of Christ and looking forward for the reward that we have in you. Looking forward for the fulfillment of the promises that you have made to us, O oh Lord. May we live with the reality, not just of the past, but of the future. May we be known as a, as a church, as a people of faith. But we also pray for our brothers and sisters, Christians in this city, in this country and around the world. Lord, may you strengthen their faith even as they journey with you. We pray all this for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.